Uh, now uh, I leave the floor to our colleague, uh, Nathan, who is part of our team and uh, uh, he can introduce uh, briefly himself. He will talk about uh, uh, prosa and um, so up to you, Nathan. Thank you, Stefania and Les Fabier for inviting me to present um, as part of this online workshop. So I'm very happy to be able to present to you, all of you in a document that we've been working on called the Progress Towards Sustainable Agriculture. So let me um, share my screen. Okay, so as I mentioned, this report that we've been working on is a product of the statistics division here in FAO, as well as the agri-food economics division, joint effort between um, these, these two divisions um, to measure progress towards sustainable agriculture and give some results. This, um, as a background, so this, uh, the report has already gone through an internal peer review within FAO um, with other divisions as well as already gone through an external peer review process. These are mostly people from other international organizations, including IFPRI and the World Bank, and also researchers from universities, including the University of Maryland. So as some uh, background on how this report is structured, so countries are classified in terms of four different farm systems typologies. These are referred to as modern food systems, traditional food systems, land intensive mixed food systems, and capital intensive mixed food systems. These groupings overlap well with those that were defined in the 2017 high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition. The groupings were made by, for those who are interested in the more technical details, they were um, classified in turn by a statistical method of principal components analysis of factor productivities in which the, the first quartile was defined to be this traditional uh, food systems typology. The second and third quartiles were split and classified in terms of either land and intensive mixed or capital intensive mixed uh, food systems typologies. And the highest quartile is this modern food systems typology. So a better description of these four different food systems typologies, okay? And here you can see a, a country mapping of where these uh, different typologies, how it's distributed across the globe. So the modern food systems are those countries which have um, are capital intensive with high land or labor productivities due to mechanization and access to modern technologies. Agriculture is highly competitive, creating a strong agricultural export market. So these are the countries that are um, shaded in yellow in this map. The traditional um, food systems typology, on the other hand, are character characterized by 
both low labor and land productivities and low capital stocks. The um, two mixed typologies, which are split between land intensive and capital intensive. The land intensive is characterized by higher productivity um, due to larger uh, land areas, which are available to the agriculturally active population, whereas the capital intensive are characterized by higher land productivity uh, due to the increased use of agricultural inputs, okay? And higher levels of capital empowerment per worker. Okay, now that's how the, the countries are, are grouped and the four different typologies. Uh, more information on the coverage. So for this report, we included a set of 16 different indicators. The dimensions um, have some, a lot of overlap with those dimensions that are used in uh, 2.4.1. Um, we have uh, six socioeconomic indicators, 10 environmental indicators, and the time period over the for the report is in for most indicators 1961 to 2017 with some indicators such as the prevalence of undernourishment or pesticides use starting in the in the 1990s now for the data source this the the data is exclusively from Faustat, with the exception of water use, where we are using uh, Aquastat, which is another uh, data platform for, for water use in agriculture available in Faustat. Um, most, a lot of this data comes uh, directly from questionnaires that are uh, dispatched to our focal points and uh, process with an annual dispatch collection and dissemination cycle. Um, so an important distinction here with uh, the PROSA report is we are working at country level data, okay? So this, all of this data that, um, and the trends and that we use in the report come exclusively from country level data in, as opposed to farm level data for, for 2.4.1. There is a traffic light approach used also in this report um, in which there are also uh, qualitative parameters assigned uh, in terms of traffic lights, which are this red light, red, green, and yellow. Um, for each of the, the, the pros and sub indicators. And these are aggregated using country agricultural area as weights to produce a, a dashboard by each food systems topology. So an important uh, distinction between the traffic light approach that's used here and is that for this report, we're really focusing on progress over time, okay? So while the, all of the, the, um, the, the classifications in terms of traffic lights for, are, are made exclusively in terms of either uh, gains or decreases, okay? So, we're looking at changes in the indicators from one time period to the next. Gains across these two time periods are classified as yellow. If that same gain is maintained for a second period of time, it's classified as green, whereas decreases across any two successive periods are classified as red. So, as I mentioned, when looking, when talking about the coverage, also th this data is, 
is country level um, and we're focusing on crop and livestock production systems. Okay. Um, I should mention for this traffic light approach, okay. So although it's exclusively gains and, uh, and or deterioration in terms of how we are classifying the, the uh, traffic lights across two, two time periods, for, um, for some of the indicators, we have defined a, a physical threshold and gains are defined as moving towards or away from that physical threshold. So we're still looking at changes over time, but we have thresholds defined for, for three of those indicators, such as for the soil nutrient balance, which I'll, you will see in the next slide as one of the indicators listed, we have a physical threshold of uh, that's defined as five kilograms per hectare, fertilizer use 50 kilograms per hectare, and pesticides use 1.25 kilograms per active ingredient per hectare. These thresholds were defined using uh, the existing data with uh, global medians to, um, to define these thresholds. So, Um, I'd like to, uh, without presenting PROSA as a proxy for 2.41, nonetheless, the, there is important correspondences between the PROSA indicators and 2.4.1, and these indicators themselves were chosen in the context of having looked at 2.4.1 and, and, um, quite in detail and um, you will see the dimensions for uh, correspond and we have um, very similar or mostly matching themes, okay? So um, I can list, um, I can go through the, the indicators, um, at least listing them at least the, the progress towards sustainable agriculture column. So we have uh, three dimensions that we're looking at. We have the econo econ economic, social, and environmental dimensions. And then we have themes which within each of these dimensions, uh, similar to 2.4.1, which are uh, for the economic theme, productivity, profitability, and resilience for the social, decent employment, food security, and land tenure, and for the environment, soil health, water use, fertilizer risk, pesticides risk, and biodiversity, in addition to uh, two um, indicators that were, we added a little bit late in the, in the process, which, which we decided were quite important nonetheless in measuring this progress towards sustainable agriculture, which were um, some indicators on emissions and land use. So, I mean, um, maybe also input from our Bob here on uh, if I can go through also defining more in detail uh, each of the, the indicators, or if you think uh, in the interest of time, um, I, can, um, I can move forward, or how do you guys feel as the, uh, as the organizer? Um, Nathan, let's just move forward because if we go into the details of each sub indicator that's been selected as part of the PROSA framework, then it will take us a lot of time. So uh, given, given that uh, we only maybe have uh, 10 or 15 more minutes, let's concentrate on the next slide. If participants are interested, they can always write to us and we can provide them with additional information on PROSA. Okay, that sounds great then. So I'd like to just give some um, general results that, uh, that can be highlighted as um, after looking at this report and the, the results that, we, um, that we, we find are the most important. So the available national level statistics across a range of these sub-indicators 
enables uh, a first order and complete analysis of progress towards sustainability, both in qualitative uh, and quantitative ways. The qualitative uh, way being with um, you know, the, the traffic light uh, approach, which is nonetheless uh, driven um, with, you know, I mean, the, the categorizations that nonetheless come from uh, quantitative uh, uh, differences in, in terms of looking at changes over time. So uh, just to, to mention some of the, the, the indicators and themes. So if we look at the social economic theme, we found that, uh, that pr across all the typologies, progress has been strong uh, with gross output specialization trends, nonetheless remaining um, one of the most uh, important limiting factors. So let me at least um, highlight what uh, gross output uh, specialization is. So gross output specialization is um, uh, the, um, it's, it's basically a, um, it's looking at how the value of production is distributed across different crops and livestock and whether or not the, the, the value of production is coming um, from more specialized uh, monocrops or if it's distributed evenly across different uh, crops and livestock categories. Okay, so that's what this gross output specialization is looking at. And this tends to be what we found um, the most limiting factor. So when we're looking at um, agricultural uh, land use, we found, um, so agricultural land expansion is, uh, a, is a detriment to natural ecosystems, in particular uh, forests. So the deforestation um, and conversion of forest land to agricultural land. Um, this was one of the, the very more important um, issues that we identified across all of the typologies. In terms of biodiversity, so we're looking at crops and livestock uh, diversity. Let me at least uh, highlight these two as it's one of the key um, things that I would like to highlight in terms of the results. So the crops and biostock, or the crops and livestock biodiversity are defined as Gini coefficients. And this is in terms of, for, for the crop diversification index, um, in terms of the, uh, the equal or unequal dis, uh, distribution with the Gini index of area harvested for different crops, okay? Whereas the, the livestock diversification index is also a Gini coefficient to measure how well the, or the livestock uh, market is distributed across different livestock, um, different livestock categories. So, for example, I mean, to give you context, the yes, the highest uh, level for the diversification index would be when you have a complete equal distribution in terms of those crops, in terms of area harvested, and um, which is an important. Um, factor that we identified for resilience. Where, because these countries are less susceptible to market fluctuations, having their, um, their crops equally distributed across many of them. So it doesn't always coincide with resilience. Uh, in, in particular, what we looked at for example, if we look at gross output specialization, so the value coming from crops and the, um, the diversity in terms of crops, uh, we, we found that these two does, 
uh, are not always coinciding and the relationship is uh, is 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 more complex and, uh, than just um, higher value and less less diversity or or there the differences are really uh, topology specific the soil nutrient balance and, and chemical pesticides we remain uh, significant limiting factors to agriculture sustainability in all food systems. So at both level, high, low levels and high levels of inputs. So the, the soil nutrient balance indicator that we use in the report is, uh, as I mentioned, this baseline level of that we're using of five kilograms per hectare of uh, what we're considering healthy soil, yes? And for countries that are um, using uh, high levels of fertilizers or, and or manure to, um, in their soils can have, um, you know, uh, way too high levels of the uh, soil nutrient balance, which presents a, a, a environmental risk in terms of leaching and um, other environmental risks. For uh, other countries instead that are not, um, that don't have the access or, or are not using enough uh, agricultural inputs that are below this baseline, it also remains a limiting factor and uh, work needs to be done to, to uh, aid those countries um, to, uh, to have better uh, access to the agricultural inputs that they need for, to, um, for, for productivity in agriculture. So there's a, a, another section of the report which is looking on uh, drivers of change on the path towards sustainable agriculture. This was the the, the part that was uh, done by our colleagues in the uh, agro uh, food economics division. And um, this was a combined assessment. So um, to um, the first step in, in, the, in, the, in the way that this uh, section of the report was, uh, was made was uh, a, a broad review of literature to identify quantitative indicators and select the drivers to, to analyze, use computational selection procedure and for those interested in the statistical uh, component, this is procedure is known as LASSO. This is the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And after looking at all of these relationships between the indicators, a final selection was, was made of those uh, those indicators to look at for the for the driver analysis. So the the main um, outcome or the main thing that I would like to highlight across this entire section was that perhaps the most important message is government support is one of the most important and, and direct mechanisms available to policymakers to encourage sustainable agricultural, agricultural development and cooperation uh, across uh, these different sector, sections will be needed to, to identify uh, and address all of these issues. So the, 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 the drivers of change were, were, were split into these five different uh, sections which are looking at demographics, inequality, farm size structure, global integration of agriculture, looking, for example, at foreign direct investment and agricultural exports, and uh, this government support. Um, that's pretty much it from uh, my side or Bob. I have, um, if there, or Asfandia, if there is, um, uh, additional time. I'm happy to 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 show graphically or the display, for example, of the of the traffic light uh, approach, for example. I mean, let me just uh, show, for example, yeah. So I mean, in the report that is gone through external 
food review and will be made publicly available soon. These are the, the dashboards that we've developed by food systems typology that are included in the report. So for each of these food systems typologies, looking at changes over time, have their own sustainability hotspots is, is uh, what they're referred to. And each of them have their own areas that need to be better addressed. So for example, capital intensive food systems, those that are using uh, very high levels of uh, agricultural inputs, those are the ones that need to be most critically uh, addressed for, uh, for, uh, for sustainable agriculture um, to, to high levels use of these agricultural inputs such as uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Okay. Um, I will give the floor back to Stefania and or Isfandiar and thank you all for your time. As I mentioned, the, the report will be made available uh, soon, already gone through external peer review and we're, 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 we're Okay, so uh, Nathan, thank you very much. Uh, we have one question from uh, um, Mrs. Bata. So the question is, uh, can this module capture qualitative and quantitative interaction effect between two or more sub indicators? As for example, higher use of fertilizers may interfere on the market resilience. Yes, okay. I'm not muted, right? Sorry? So, uh, okay. Yes, so thank you very much for that question. Um, and the, of course, the, the interrelationships between these indicators uh, is very complex and is nonetheless um, quite important to address these issues and look at them together. So, Yes, while the report is structured by looking at each of these indicators um, uh, separately, but nonetheless, we, we do draw some um, con important connections between um, the, the different indicators. So one, yes, you mentioned resilience, for example. Um, So for example, yes, I mean, if we look at it, it more specifically, the land intensive and modern food systems, and we look at um, diversification in terms of crops and livestock and gross output specialization, what we found for these two food systems, for example, is that they have uh, moderate uh, levels of gross output specialization, meaning um, that and, and low levels of diversification, which these two together uh, can mean higher, higher exposure to climate risks on the overall uh, um, agricultural sustainability of these two food systems topologies. And we do draw some other connections, uh, important connections between the, the, the indicators. Uh, nonetheless, this, this uh, as you all know um, as well as I do, the, this, uh, this multi-dimensional um, uh, uh, looking at all of these different aspects together of, um, of uh, sustainable agriculture is a, is a complex issue and, uh, and we're, we're happy to see also the, the work that's being done by uh, 2.4.1 to, um, to look at all of these dimensions together. Okay, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, we don't have any other questions for now. So uh, I think we can uh, thank you once again, Nathan, for this uh, intervention. And uh, we pass to the, we move to the, to the next presentation then. Okay, so thank, you, again, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. 
So uh, you can stop the sharing of your screen. Okay. I suppose I should do that. Okay. You can't? I think I can stop. Oh. Okay, you did. Okay, great. So now I'm going to, uh, no, sorry. I'm going to give first the floor to, to Aspan de Yar. So thank you very much, Stefani. And indeed, thank you, Nathan, for making time to present very well the PROSA approach that FAO is currently working on. So uh, for, the, for the sake of uh, participants, I mean, this, uh, as Nathan mentioned, this is still work in progress. So we are in process of uh, peer reviewing the, the report with uh, both in-house and external experts and will be available soon. One point that I would really like to emphasize uh, and explicitly highlight is that the PROSA um, framework, as Nathan mentioned, is based on available data, national data that, that has been um, uh, you know, shared by countries with FAO. So all the information that we use for this framework is already available with us. But this doesn't mean that, you know, this framework is going to replace or substitute two for one in terms of uh, the uh, monitoring of or reporting on uh, SDG uh, indicator two for one. So from this perspective, what I'm trying to say is that this is a complementary process that is uh, initiated by FAO. Um, while we are waiting for uh, data on SDG 241, we thought that we may want to understand as to what's happening with sustainable agriculture globally and uh, regionally. And hence, uh, we are looking uh, uh, into, into other approaches uh, that could later on, uh, you know, be complemented uh, once 241 is uh, implemented and operationalized uh, at a country level. So with this very small, uh, uh, you know, um, talk, I will now show you the, the SDG 241 um, web page, which is, um, which is basically, let me just, can you see my screen now, Stefania? Yes. Okay, so let me just. So can you see this web page? Yes. Okay. So basically, as I was telling you yesterday, you know, as part of my presentation, the all the sustainable development goals or uh, and and the indicators that FAO is custodian for, we have a dedicated web portal. So here, you know, you, we can provide you with this link, though it's already there in the presentations. So here you can see all the relevant information that you need to know about the SDG indicators that we're responsible for. So as you can see here, um, the indicators are clustered by different goals. So, uh, you know, all the 21 SDG indicators are listed here. What you need to do is basically you just pick any indicator as we are discussing, you know, uh, our the, uh, today uh, SDG 241. So I will click this, uh, um, indicator, and it will take me to a dedicated page of SDG 241. And if once you scroll down, once you scroll down, you will see all the necessary documents that I've, we have been talking about throughout our presentations over the course of past uh, two days. Um, you can find it here. And you know, just by Clicking on these uh, documents, you can uh, readily download this. So we have the methodological note. Then we have the FAO data collection uh, questionnaire, which I was talking about yesterday, uh, which Stefania, in fact, was talking about yesterday. It's available in three languages. Then we have the survey module that I uh, mentioned in my presentation yesterday, which countries can use to collect information, uh, you know, from the holdings to uh, uh, to uh, basically measure and monitor SDG 241. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this survey module is, uh, can be administered as standalone uh, survey, or it can be, uh, you know, integrated at appropriate places within your current agriculture. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, wow. 
Apart from that, you know, we have been talking about other uh, um, related or background documents. So the sampling guidance for 241, those who may be interested in understanding more about it. Guidelines on data analysis and reporting. So once the information is collected, how do you then analyze information and then uh, report on uh, the respective uh, sub indicator by sustainability status. It, this document also give information about the construction of the dashboard and the aggregate indicator. Then we have instruction manual on data entry operation. This is soon after once the information is collected, how, what softwares do you, can, can you use for you to basically um, enter your data into and, and, all the, and all the steps afterwards, like say, for example, in terms of coding, in terms of uh, cleaning the data, et cetera. And then the enumerator manual, which is well before the data collection process. Uh, this manual can be used to train the enumerator surveyors and the supervisors be before their field deployment. And uh, you can, um, uh, you know, th this is a very helpful document because each and every question which is given in the survey module is then explained in the enumerator manual step by step. So all the details uh, related to how the question should be asked, you know, whether to probe the uh, uh, respondent more for further details, all kind, of, all those kind of uh, uh, details and nitty gritties uh, has been captured in this enumerator manual. So you can access it readily. I mean, by 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 going here. Plus, you know, all our capacity development efforts back in 2019, and uh, you know, um, and and for for the for the previous years have been captured. Uh, you know, in this in this part. So by clicking on these links, you will not only see the 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 concept notes, but all, as well the presentations that were presented back then due. To, to, to these countries. And of course, the e-learning course that we have developed for SCG 241 by clicking on the e-learning course, it will take you to, you know, to, to this resource and uh, you can take this course at your own, um, you know, uh, convenience for you to be able to report on, uh, to, to familiarize yourself more with, uh, with, with the indicator. And then of course, uh, you know, other related, uh, you know, um, stream of work that we took into account while developing the methodology of SDG uh, 241. And of course, the focal point information is, uh, is, is, given, is, given, is given here as well. And then uh, the contact uh, uh, details. So this is this email address is for the Office of the Chief Statistician. We will update this page with our email address as well. So I will uh, you know, request Stefania to basically note this down. And we will have our own, uh, you know, uh, email address, which is scg 241 indicator at fao.org. So, you know, uh, and not only 241, but all other 21 SDG indicators have been covered, to, you know, to, to a larger extent, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, in, in their dedicated web pages. One other thing which I would like to show you, because you haven't seen it until so far, is this survey module that we have um, um, developed for SCG 241. So when I was telling you that uh, basically um, all the information on the sub indicators, you know, the data items and the variables are captured through uh, a survey uh, questionnaire, you know, the, the, the questionnaire is here. So, you can, you know, as mentioned earlier, you can administer it as a separate survey dedicated only to 241, which is not advisable from our side, but if you are still interested, I mean, you can do that. But, you know, um, you can take the questions from here and plug this in into your current agriculture surveys or other data collection instruments using which you collect information on, uh, you know, about agriculture production for crops and livestock. And based on this, uh, you know, you can, you can collect information on 241. The similar kind of exercise was done for AGRIS, which uh, Flavio, our colleague from the survey team presented yesterday. So we took the AGRIS questionnaire and then we mapped the AGRIS questionnaire uh, against, uh, you know, this, this module of 241. And then we, then we check as to what is missing in the agris questionnaire which needs to be there for it to be sdg241 ready 
So as you can see here, you know, we have section on area of the holding. Then uh, we have questions for the economic dimension of the holding, which will help you um, basically uh, report information on, uh, co uh, collect information on uh, the three sub indicator within the economic dimension. Then we have uh, a section on environmental dimension of the holding, which will help you collect all the information um, required for the five sub indicator in the environmental dimension. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, questions on the social dimension of the holding, which will help you collect information on the on the three sub indicators of the of the social dimension. So, with this, uh, I will uh, I will stop. But you know, just to again reiterate, you know, if you want, we can share with with, with you these documents, uh, you know, um, independently as well. But as all the information is provided on this web page i would really urge you to to go there and apart from these documents you will find many much more interesting information that will be helpful for you for uh, for you to familiarize yourself not only with 241 uh, which is the focus now but as well other sdg indicator under fao uh, mandate so with this uh, I, I i i stop now you should see uh... Well, okay, so uh, you know that uh, uh, this virtual training uh, uh, is focusing on the SDG 241, which we know it's a very new indicator. So the data collection is a process that we just started. But FAO, in particular the Statistics Division, has a very long experience in uh, collecting the data. Uh, the analysis carried out based on food and agricultural statistics is a, a pillar for the uh, for the FAO activities. Indeed, this is explicitly mentioned in the Article 1 of uh, FAO Constitution. We have FAUSTAT uh, for food and agricultural statistics. We have FISHTAT for aquaculture and fisheries. And we have uh, uh, Aquastat for water and in irrigation. They all englobe an established and well-known process of uh, uh, data collection and reporting mechanism. Uh, they are part, in, in fact, of the organization's missions, uh, mission to improve the data collection and dissemination for the development and the fight against hunger uh, and malnutrition. Uh, the focal points for reporting all this data are uh, uh, expert staff from the National Statistical Offices, the Minister of Agriculture, and other relevant agencies, of which some are in attendance today. Within this context, uh, FAO gets regularly uh, the national data on crop and livestock production, on environmental and social economic uh, issues. Uh, they are, they, they, that they are all relevant to the uh, two for one indicator. Looking in details uh, on FAUSTAT, which is responsibility, as I said, of the statistics division of FAO. It is, uh, uh, FAUSTAT is a, a database disseminated on the web. Uh, it is based on an open source uh, uh, software platform called Phoenix, where data are free and available in all UN official languages for over 245 countries and territories, and covers all FAO regional groups in, groupings from 1961 to the most recent year available for the specific country. We have on FAUSTAT more than a million statistics. Uh, all this data covers uh, uh, 15 domains, which are listed here. So production, trade, food balance, uh, food security, etc. They are listed here. Finally, uh, the data are disseminated through web pages, through publications, working papers, and statistical uh, yearbooks. You have here the link to the web page. And uh, uh, just for your information, we have approximately 160,000 users uh, per month. 
they are using uh, the FAO Fausat uh, platform. How we collect uh, uh, the data? So we have uh, seven questionnaires that we dispatch annually, so every year, and uh, mm, the responsibilities for that for those questions is divided by three teams in the statistics division. Uh, we have uh, the environmental team, which is the team where uh, Aspan de and myself are working in, uh, that deals with the land use questionnaire, pesticide and fertilizer questionnaire. Then we have the production teams that is uh, uh, responsible for, for the production uh, questionnaire. And finally, the third team is the social and statistics team that send annually so the trade and government expenditure and the prices questionnaire. Of course, the environmental team is the one more linked to the SDG 241, since uh, uh, many sub-indicators are calculated through data that comes from uh, this questionnaire. Uh, although the primary method of data collection is through these questionnaires, some teams uh, uh, sometimes consider also external sources. So, uh, for example, they use uh, uh, the official ones like uh, the National Statistical Office's website, but also some other semi-official. So, for example, the Oil World uh, website for the prices, just to mention one. Uh, these are uh, snapshots on how the questionnaires are uh, visualized. So always comes, uh, uh, always, they always come in an Excel format, uh, similar to the questionnaires uh, we have seen uh, uh, on the uh, SDG 241 indicators. So let me show you now uh, an overview of the focal points for some of the questionnaires uh, uh, so in your country and the responses that we have got in the last three years. So we kindly ask you to maybe to have a look and just in case you know that one uh, is not anymore the focal point, uh, you just inform us. Um, mm, let's see, so how, for example, this is the questionnaire of the land use. So how the data are linked to the 241 indicator. Uh, they are linked uh, uh, and they are used to calculate the denominator of 241 and they are linked to the team 5 uh, in particular through the indicator so of variation in water availability and to the team number team 8 which is the sub indicator use of uh, agrobiodiversity supportive practice the year indicated in the columns is the year of the dispatch of the questionnaire so asking the data for the previous year. Uh, so in these last three years, we have got data from almost all the countries uh, with the exception of Kazakhstan. So we hope to receive data uh, from this country also on the next dispatch that is planned in a couple of weeks actually. So it's expecting very soon. This is the situation for the fertilizer questionnaires. So the fertilizer is linked to the 241 with the team number six, so it's sub indicators, sub indicator management of fertilizers. Here we have a couple of countries that didn't send any data in the last three years. In this case, they are Afghanistan and uh, Indonesia. Pesticide uh, linked to the team seven which is uh, the sub-indicator management of pesticide. This is clearly the question where uh, we lack mostly the data. We can see a lot of uh, N, which is, means that we didn't receive any information uh, from many countries and for mostly all the years, the last three years. The production is probably uh, the opposite, so the always more filled questionnaire. Indeed, many data seem available for the team one, one, team one which is the farm output uh, value predictor, and the three, team three, which is the risk uh, mitigation mechanism. For this questionnaire, the next uh, dispatch is, is planned for uh, May uh, 2021. 
finally, uh, the prices questionnaires is linked uh, again as the production questionnaire to the team one productivity and team three uh, resilience. Uh, Pakistan here uh, didn't provide any data uh, in the last uh, three years. So concluding, uh, when uh, we dispatched the two for one questionnaires, and you need to respond on the 11 sub-indicators, please remember that the relevant national statistics already reported to FAO, because you will probably find many information on topics that are relevant already to the SDG 241. As Canada explained us yesterday very well, some of the national statistics could be used for an initial proxy uh, reporting. So this pro proxy approach can be used while capacities uh, to collect and analyze more detailed farm level data improve over time in your country. And thus, uh, of course, the reporting on the 241 indicator. Finally, uh, leveraging on existing expertise can be used as a basis to strengthen national statistics processes and plan, of course, improvements to national surveys and census processes. So that was a, a, a very uh, quick um, overview of the uh, FAUSAT and uh, uh, so the reporting to, to, to FAO. Uh, um, we move uh, immediately to uh, this presentation that Aspandiar is uh, showing you now on the short, medium and long-term expectations. So I give you the floor, Aspandiar. Can you hear me now? Yes, now yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, Stefania, once again. Um, so just to recollect as to what we have covered over the past uh, three days. So we discussed the conceptual and methodological basis for SDG 241. We discussed uh, and thoroughly showed you uh, its data collection instruments. Um, tools and the background documents as well as well as mechanism for reporting it uh, uh, to FAO. Now this presentation will cover the progress made by FAO until so far, our planned future course of action and expectation in terms of countries readiness to report on the indicator in the short, medium and long term. Um, our ultimate aim obviously is to maximize country reporting on the on the indicator amongst, uh, you know, the 21 others and thereby gradually classify it as tier one over time. Tier one means that uh, uh, majority of the countries uh, are reporting on the on the indicator to FAO. In summary, uh, we will, uh, uh, as part of uh, this presentation, uh, we will cover the following aspects, the methodological front, capacity development uh, und undertaken and envisioned, uh, activities on the data collection uh, uh, side already undertaken and uh, the, the one planned for, uh, for the rest of the year and next year, and the reporting uh, of the indicator to FAO. Towards the end of the presentation, we will openly discuss uh, the issues and constraints that impede countries' implementation, data collection, and reporting efforts, and deliberate the means and ways on how to overcome these constraints and challenges. So by now, you may have a very good idea that the methodology of 241 is based on uh, farm survey that is used as a main data collection instrument for all uh, sub-indicators. Um, reaching at this stage where the methodology is approved now has been a long participatory process that involved discussion with uh, experts, both from countries like yourself, and as well as uh, you know experts from international organizations, private sectors, uh, academia, et cetera. 
and several round of, um, of testing and follow up technical work on the development of the support documents. So the methodology, as I mentioned to you earlier in my previous presentation, was approved and endorsed by IEGSTG in November 2018. There were a few other areas which the IAEGSTG um, wanted us to uh, improve on. So uh, in this respect, you know, we, uh, we, we constituted this informal group of countries, which I explained with respect to the biodiversity sub-indicator yesterday. And then we worked the entire 2019 with the selected group to refine the criteria of the biodiversity indicator. And in November 2019, once again, the group reapproved and re-endorsed uh, the refinements that we proposed. So um, in total, uh, for the development of the methodology, we organized uh, three expert group meetings. We presented it regularly at the Scientific Advisory Committee of Global Strategy uh, to Improve Agriculture and Rural Statistics. We carried out an online global consultation where at one stage the methodology was shared with the national statistical offices of all the member states of all the countries across the globe for their comments. And thereafter, we, we conducted several webinars with the IAE GSTG members on the refinements uh, uh, for biodiversity sub indicator. Now I, I mentioned that we tested the different aspects of the methodology thoroughly. So we conducted desk tests in Bangladesh, Kyrgyz Republic, Ecuador, Belgium, and Rwanda. These were carried out back in 2016 and 17. We carried out cognitive tests in Kenya, uh, Mexico, and Bangladesh um, for the survey questionnaire that I showed you uh, a little while ago. We field tested the survey questionnaire in Bangladesh in 2018 that I showed you as well as while we were covering the respective sub indicator I was showing some examples of the Bangladesh data. So, um, um, so that was that. Then uh, we tested the FAO data collection questionnaire which Stefania showed you yesterday in uh, 45 countries and she showed you the findings as well in terms of response rate and in terms of uh, other aspects uh, and findings of, uh, of this testing. Now, all the background documents have been finalized and uploaded to the FAO SDG portal, which I showed you a little while ago. That is the methodological note, survey questionnaire, sample design, enumerator manual, calculation procedure or analysis uh, guidance uh, etc. On the capacity development front, we have uh, trained more than 50 plus countries on the indicators methodology already. The methodology of 241, as we were progressing, uh, you know, on developing it was presented at uh, um, um, African Commission on Agriculture Statistics in 2017, FAO Committee on Agriculture in 2018, as well in 2019. Then it was pre presented at Brussels briefing organized by the European Commission in 2019 and International Conference on Agriculture Statistics in India in 2019. Of course, we conducted some bilateral trainings as well, whereby we went to the respective country uh, to train their staff on the SDG 241 methodology exclusively. In this respect, uh, in 2019, um, uh, I went to Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Oman to, um, to basically train their national staff uh, on, on the indicator. Uh, there was a training organized for 10 African countries in collaboration with the um, with UNICA and it, Ethiopian Ministry of uh, Agriculture in 2019. And the following countries participated in that training, um, which included Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, and uh, Zambia. Then we 
trained 17 countries from Asia and uh, North Africa in 2019. That included Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Mauritania, Morocco, uh, and so on. Uh, and then last year as well, we um, conducted another training which was uh, organized for Asia and Pacific region, which happened in Japan, Chiba last year, um, whereby many of uh, the country's uh, participants who are uh, gracing us with their presence now were, uh, were uh, represented in that training. So just to exemplify Nepal, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Pakistan, um, you know, all these countries uh, were, uh, were there as part, of, uh, as part of this training. In 2020, uh, apart from the first batch of the virtual trainings that we are uh, having now, uh, whereby we are training uh, you guys, uh, including Afghanistan, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Nepal, and Pakistan, and Vietnam, we have two other lined up, uh, you know, for the second and third batch. Uh, one is happening from 22nd to 24th of September, primarily for Latin American countries, as well as Russia. And then uh, another round scheduled in October from 14 to 16, which will primarily include countries from um, Middle East and, uh, and Africa. Um, in terms of um, uh, additional uh, trainings, uh, you know, uh, additional capacity development efforts, we have, I, I spoke about it, we have uh, developed the e-learning courses, we have translated the key documents into Arabic, Spanish and French, which may not be relevant to most of you. Um, but then again, I mean, um, um, because of the coverage of the SDG indicator is because it's applicable to all countries across the globe. At least uh, we wanted to cover um, the um, Arabic, uh, Spanish and French speaking countries. Of course, we will translate it into, um, to, into Russian and, uh, and uh, Chinese as well. Um, we also took advantage of other in-house uh, colleagues uh, while they were taking missions uh, to for, for their own uh, uh, work to countries to raise awareness about SDG 241 and to confirm information on the national focal points and and uh, to assess uh, national data availability on the indicator. Um, in 2021, we will continue uh, to arrange and organize uh, virtual trainings for the rest of the world, given the COVID-19 crisis, because of which uh, um, traditional travel arrangements are no longer possible. So from this perspective, uh, it seems like the virtual training uh, can, can, can serve uh, uh, some uh, purpose. Um, provided if the situation in 2021 is improved, then we will also uh, definitely look into organizing in-person bilateral training based on requests from the countries. And these trainings will not only involve the methodological and conceptual uh, details that we discussed during this training, but to really sit with the countries, you know, open their agriculture questionnaires, open, open their sampling documents and uh, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, sleeves, uh, roll, roll our sleeves up and uh, try to integrate the questions from the survey model of 241 into the country agriculture statistical system for them to be able to um, collect information on 241. Uh, of course, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, we have plans to translate all the documents, including the e-learning uh, material into all official uh, uh, UN languages. And we are also planning on developing digital lectures on SDG 241, which will be, which will be available uh, hopefully uh, by second or third quarter of, uh, of uh, 
on uh, on the data collection front therefore data collection questionnaire and reporting protocols have already been developed and put in place in 2020 uh, as stefania covered in detail from december 2019 to april 2020 we carried out the testing of the fao data collection questionnaire uh, on 241 uh, we tested in 45 countries we received a very uh, thorough feedback uh, very valuable one based on which we uh, adjusted the questionnaire and uh, it gives us a very um, useful insights in terms of uh, the data availability at uh, at the country level in august of uh, uh, of this year we sent a comprehensive uh, global dispatch by that i mean to say we sent the fao data collection questionnaire to to all member states uh, if i'm not mistaken we sent it to 213 countries stefania correct me if i'm wrong um, and then uh, from September to November, our idea is that once we start receiving the information from countries on the questionnaire, we start uh, the, the analysis, uh, gap filling, quality assurance and quality control processes, whereby we may, we may again come back to you regarding uh, the data that you have reported uh, using that questionnaire. Um, in December uh, 2020, our idea is to draft analysis and finalize it for uh, uh, reporting to United Nations Statistical Division. Uh, that, that is a process that we, uh, we have for all the 11 SDG indicators. So once we receive data from the member states, we, um, we estimate uh, the regional and global uh, aggregates and we develop storylines uh, you know and then uh, then share it with UNSD of course this year reporting uh, on 241 will be conditional as to whether we receive sufficient data from countries to prepare the the storylines and uh, you know of course uh, the global and regional aggregates and trends that I just spoke about um, for 2021 data collection cycle we have the following recurrent activities planned i mean from january to july of course we will uh, we will be busy uh, in preparation of and then we will send the dispatch to countries as planned in july or august and then from july and november again the same process which i spoke about so we will do analysis gap filling quality assurance and quality control and then by December 2021, we will report it to uh, UNSD. Now, again, referring to the presentation from uh, yesterday, the low response rates to the 2019 SDG 241 pilot questionnaire were both uh, expected and uh, indicative, showing in general the complexity of the indicators methodology. It's not an easy indicator. We there are 11 sub indicators as part of the framework. And thus the lack of sufficient and relevant data required to report on the, on the indicator. Um, and thus in the, in the very short term, that is 2021, we expect that several countries, if not, if not uh, uh, many, will only be able to report on the partial dashboard for 241 based on the current farm survey uh, uh, level data approach. So we don't expect you to report on the on all the 11 sub indicators of 241. You know, for, for us, a very good start would be if you start reporting on, on the sub indicator on which data already exists. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three. It could be like, you know, the indicators can be spread uh in, in in different dimensions or it could only be from the economic dimension it doesn't matter at least we have to start somewhere in terms of uh, in terms of uh, reporting uh, the data on the two for one so if if you come back to us with only one or two or three sub indicators or any subset of the sub indicators of two for one that is just fine for us we would from this, we will know that where the problems are, which sub-indicator the country is still struggling to report data on, 
and then we can engage with you more intensively on how to bridge the data gaps for the rest of the 11 sub indicators on which data is not available. Now, as highlighted yesterday, in the medium to long term, uh, however, in addition to existing farm survey based methodology, we have um, initiated and embarked on a work program to explore the possibility of developing a solution based on alternative data sources. Of course, the solution will be for selected sub indicators, uh, which in combination and complementarity with farm survey will facilitate uh, countries uh, reporting on SDG 241. We will, we will cover this point in more detail in the upcoming slide, particularly on the alternative data sources. In parallel, uh, our outreach and capacity development activities will continue, of course, in close coordination with Agress Survey Program and 50 by 2030 initiative uh, that was uh, uh, presented briefly by our colleague Flavio Bolliger uh, yesterday. And, and we also are reaching out to potential external partners uh, to support us, uh, you know, basically uh, implement the detailed farm level data for uh, SDG uh, 241 monitoring. Now, as highlighted yesterday, and this slide is more of, uh, you know, taken from yesterday presentation, but it's very good to have this, uh, to to, uh, for it to be shown again. Um, the methodological note of SDG 241, once you thoroughly, uh, you know, uh, read through it, discusses the possibility of using a combination of different data sources as an alternative option for reporting on 241 if the country wishes uh, to do so. So some of the, um, uh, alternative data sources apart from agriculture surveys that have been proposed by, um, by countries is administrative records, agri crops and livestock census, environmental monitoring systems such as uh, sampling, soil sampling, laboratory testing, etc. Uh, ge geographical information system or remote sensing or earth observation, household surveys, and other dipstick studies or specialized ad hoc studies that have been conducted uh, by the countries uh, uh, in order to uh, investigate certain aspects, uh, you know, which are listed here. Now, the methodological note do propose these alternative data sources but it doesn't go into the details of how can countries utilize this, okay? So I will, I will cover that part uh, in, 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 my, in my next slide. Um, though we are proposing alternative data sources, there are several challenges that are associated with, um, uh, with, uh, with, with, with this option because the sources vary widely, both within and across countries due to different objectives of the alternative data sources, different scale of assessment. Um, you know, for, for, for 241, the scale of assessment is farm level. For these other sources, the scale of assessment may be agroecological zone or district or tehsil or, you know, maybe some other level. The scope may be different because the scope of 241 is crops and livestock and a mix of both these production systems. For these other um, data sources, the scope may only be, um, you know, crops or maybe a subsector within crop focusing primarily on, 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 on certain crops that are important for the country. Or maybe these, these studies are focused only on, on, on livestock. And, and plus, you know, they may, employ different definitions and different terminologies. Apart from that, the second uh, challenge is uh, temporal resolutions of, uh, of these different alternative data sources. So maybe a study was conducted back in 2015 or maybe 2010 and, and was not repeated afterwards periodically. And hence it could, you know, basically um, complicate uh, the, the reporting processes 
because then it will involve interpolation and extrapolations and using growth rates, uh, et cetera, and coefficients. Um, so so um, it's, it's not that straightforward. <coughs> Excuse me. And plus the periodicity of the data sets uh, may vary as well in terms of like, say, for example, the recommended periodicity for 241 is, uh, is three years. Uh, in some countries, the agriculture or, or livestock census, uh, the periodicity is, is five years or maybe 10 years. Or, you know, for some other surveys, these are ad hoc surveys which were conducted one time and they, they are not going to be repeated. So how to, how to address those issues of periodicity in terms of the, in terms of the data sets. Sampling issues, again, it's closely related with the alternative data sources. You know, these sources may, may have a sample uh, which has different designs, different sizes. There may be under or non-coverage issues of agriculture holding, particularly this may be the case if we decide on using labor force survey to report on decent employment or wage rate in agriculture. But then the question would be as to whether agriculture ho households are uh, properly covered in, in those uh, surveys for us to say something about uh, about uh, the situation uh, on that particular sub-indicator in, uh, in, uh, for agriculture holdings. There could be different unit of measurement. Of course, the unit of measurement in case of 241 is, uh, is farm survey. Uh, and, 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 and we are interested, uh, you know, we, we, we administer this question to the agriculture holding and then we relate that to the agriculture area of the holding. So in these other um, um, uh, studies or in other surveys or other sources of information, uh, the, the unit of measure may be different. And hence, how do we relate that information to the agriculture land area of the country may pose a challenge. Then, um, of course, uh, the, the um, issue with the adjusting and harmonizing um, uh, different baselines uh, uh, across different countries for the same source or different baselines for the different sources within the same country. So how do we, how do we adjust those differences uh, and how do we set baselines? That, that, that again is another issue. Um, and plus on top of this, uh, integrating um, data from different data sources is usually is usually complicated due to lack of efficient uh, coordination uh, mechanisms for inter and intra institutional, uh, uh, you know, um, coordination. So usually what we see at the country level is that NSO is the basically NSO and Minister of Agriculture are the two uh, apics or important uh, agencies at the country level who are responsible for generation of and then uh, basically use of uh, the data when, it, when, when it's, it's collected for policy making. However, given the, the wide variety of themes and sub indicators that we capture as part of 241, there may be other institution involved that may have the requisite data and hence this coordination mechanism needs to be, needs to be put in place which adds another level of, uh, of um, challenge. Now, given these challenges that I just described, several aspects needs to be carefully considered prior to using alternative data sources in order to produce consistent um, and reliable data uh, and set the thresholds as per recommended periodicity of, of the indicator. Okay. So we cannot say that basically we have information available in, uh, in our alternative data sources uh, and it rests with certain institution, but then that information may be very basic, may not be sufficient to basically construct the indicator and then set the threshold for us to assign the sustainability uh, criteria and then basically uh, assign proportion. So before using alternative data sources, it is advised that the use of, of these sources may be considered when the available data set fulfill the following uh, criteria. First and foremost, um, it should be demonstrated that the alternative data sources give at least the same result 
uh, and quality as, as, the, as the farm service can be reflected in or in attributed to agricultural land area in the country, considering the different farm typologies and agriculture regions. This is, this is a very key point because if, if you, if, even if you have alternative in, uh, data available in some institution, how do you link that with the agriculture area of the, of the country, which is the basis for assigning uh, sustainability uh, status to agriculture in a country? Furthermore, it, you know, the fact that it can be associated with the agriculture uh, uh, production systems, particularly crops and uh, crops, livestock and the combination in between. So the problem is that there may be studies at a country level for focused only on crops or another focused only on livestock. So how do you integ integrate that information? And what about the holdings which are in a way specialized uh, in both these, uh, in both these uh, production um, systems. Um, the alternative data sources should capture at the same aspect and phenomena as proposed in the farm survey, as described uh, in the indicators um, um, metadata sheets. Uh, plus, it should be made sure that these are representative of the situation at the national level with respect to agriculture land area, taking into account the major agriculture regions uh, the, and crops and livestock. So it could very well be the case that, you know, a particular source of information, existing source of information is, is collected only for a certain region of the country, okay? And not for the, for the entire country. So in that case, how do you generalize that information to, to, to a national level? Um, then uh, the fact that data needs to be available at the same level of territorial disaggregation as proposed in the farm survey and um, uh, data collection here and uh, periodicity are homogeneous uh, um, across the sub indicators. I mean, this is at least recommended, even if it is not homogeneous, we can still live with it by you highlighting that, you know, information on the XYZ sub indicator is available uh, for uh, for air um, um, x or air y, but then again, if it is homogeneous across all the sub indicator, then that would be excellent. Finally, using uh, alternative data sources implies that mechanisms should be put in place at the country level to coordinate regularly the flow of required information generated by by uh, various uh, various institutions. And of course, lastly, that the alternative data source needs to be com compliant with uh, or adhere to um, international and national standards and classification systems in order to ensure the indicator to be internationally comparable. Otherwise, if every country is using uh, 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 you know, a source of information which is not consistent in terms of standards and classification, then you know, the, the, sole pro the sole purpose of us comparing uh, countries um, internationally is because of the fact that we, we you know we are not going to be comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges so uh, on top of this uh, you know as uh, as was evident in canada presentation yesterday alternative data sources can certainly be used to complement farm data uh, information. That was a very excellent presentation, which gave us a very good insight as to how developed countries are going about using alternative data sources in combination with farm survey. Um, so anyway, the countries can replace, uh, you know, using alternative data sources, they can replace the farm uh, survey questions with alternative data sources of information once available and respond to the criteria that I just mentioned. The, these can also be used to complement farm survey question by providing additional contextual information that is helpful uh, to probe the right answers from the respondent. Uh, as I was mentioning yesterday, this can be done uh, exempt or, or, or during the data collection by providing contextual information to the enumerator before going to the field. Or, uh, you know, it can be also be used to cross check the farm survey results once analyzed and reported to identify any inconsistencies and to ensure its robustness. Uh, this exposed information 
can be used to triangulate and validate uh, survey data after the data collection and analysis has been completed as I just uh, highlighted. So um, we will soon kickstart uh, work on developing practical guidance on how alternative data sources can be used by the countries for SDG 241 measurement and monitoring. As a first step that we have already undertaken between October and December, we will work on exploring the potential use of earth observation that is remote sensing for reported re reporting on selected indicator of 241. Uh, we have also a plan to expand this effort in January and March 2021 to include other data sources that I just showed you on the previous slide, like administrative records, household surveys, uh, uh, monitoring systems, etc. for reporting on uh, selected sub indicators. And during the same period, uh, with the help of, of course, um, uh, international experts, we will draft uh, a proposal and, and test protocols and select uh, countries for testing the uh, approach developed um, using, uh, you know, the alternative data sources. And from April to June, we will test and um, analyze um, um, uh, the proposed approach by collecting information on using both the farm survey and earth observation approach and then triangulate the results to see as to whether it makes sense. And then from July to August, we will, we will work on drafting the guidelines on how and how these sources can be used to report on, uh, on SCG 241. The guidelines will be finalized hopefully by December 2021 and uh, you know, we will then disseminate it to countries by publishing not only on, on our website, but reaching out to the focal points of uh, SDG 241 that we usually do uh, at different intervals and uh, we will share it with them. So with this, I will stop my present, go through the next two slides. Uh, these are summarizing the, the, next, uh, the next steps. Um, so again, let me highlight that uh, we have shared with you the stock taking Excel sheet. I'm, I'm referring to it again and again, because this is uh, uh, really the key. So what we would like you to do is to basically fill it in and um, this will not only help you, but as well us to assess the data gaps vis-a-vis -vis the SDG 241 requirements, okay? Then, you know, the second point is that we have sent, you know, Stefania mentioned, and I've been mentioning it uh, time and again, um, we have sent you the FAO data collection questionnaire in, in August uh, last month. Um, we would we would like you to respond to that. I mean, once you fill in the stock taking exercise, filling in, you know, the, the data collection question is not going to be a big problem. A big problem in a, in a, uh, is not going to be a big problem because of the fact that you, you will have all the data reflected here. And then we have given you all the methodology that you need to know about 241, uh, which we explained to you over the course of three days for you to fill in this questionnaire. Then, you know, an important step for you guys are, and this is what we expect from you, maybe like say, for example, Stefania, for, for this, for, 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 for step three and, and step one, both, let us give them some time, okay? For to, tomorrow, they, they're not gonna be able to report on this. Okay. So, so let's, let's aim for the end of the next week, okay? Or maybe, maybe if you want to keep it more flexible then today is the 10th, uh, let's, let's aim for the 20th of, uh, of September, okay? For, for, for them to give us uh, feedback on point one and uh, point, point three. So point three is basically about what we have been discussing as part of uh, the, 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 the questions that we raised, right? So these questions that, that which I showed you on the previous slide, um, we, would, we would urge you, we would request you to encapsulate, to cover these in a three page action plan, okay? Uh, two to three page action plan. It can be more pages provided if you want to give more details for implementation and reporting on 241. So again, I mean, isolate and identify the constraints that inhibit reporting on the entire dashboard, okay? Which was again from, from the question. 
and what actions do you believe you will take and by when for the countries to be able to collect data on 241 and report it to FAO? Again, to answer these questions, you know, maybe two, three paragraphs along with a table whereby, you know, you enlist the actions that you need to take. You, you plug in some kind of uh, time frame as to when you will be able to undertake those actions and complete those actions. And then, you know, you, you, in, you have a responsibility column whereby you say that, you know, uh, this is the support that we need from FAO and these are the tasks that we, we are gonna carry out on our own. Now, so this is, this is your task. This is, this is what we expect from you. This is the requested information um, um, as, as an outcome of this training. This action plan will be crucial for us. Uh, for us to understand as to as to uh, how do we structure our work plan for the next year. Um, for us, the next steps would be, we will send you all the final presentations that got presented once again, because there were some trivial changes in the presentation as we were progressing. And the background material, I mean, Stefania has had provided you with all the links. I have showed you all the uh, resources where you can find it on the FAO SDG portal. Um, so we will, uh, we will do that. We will send you a summary report of this training, you know, uh, highlighting the basic aspects that we covered, the discussion points that you raised, and uh, possible next steps that we, we showed you, you know, on this slide, the action plan and the stock taking exercise and responding to the FAO data collection questionnaire. And then, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, we will plan activity based on the action plans and stock attending exercise submitted by, by, by yourself. So that this is really the key. This is really the key. So uh, please don't take it as a training whereby, you know, it, it happened and, uh, you know, it's another thing that I took care of. And, uh, you know, so we need to carry forward this, this process. We want to continue to support you in this process, because this is the, the very first step. It's not the end, but it's the means to an end. So we have to go a long way before you can start reporting on sustainable agriculture. There, of course, the, the ultimate aim is not for you to report two for one, but the ultimate aim is to use the information that, is, that, will, that will help you report on two for one for national policy making, because that's what matters, okay? So we really want to address the core issues of poverty, hunger, malnutrition. That is the, the objective of the ultimate aim and objective of FAO. And this indicator will help us uh, you know, take care of those issues. So the ultimate goal, remember, is not reporting on the indicator, but the ultimate goal is to improve policies and decisions at the country level for you to improve the food and agriculture situation of the countries and address the hunger, malnutrition, and poverty related issues at the country level. With this, uh, I, I, I thank you, I mean, uh, thank you very much for your time, for your interaction, for your very rich discussion. It was a very nice to, to have this uh, meeting with you guys. And uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, Stefania- yes. yes, so uh, we will share also this uh, recording, of course, uh, so you can see again uh, uh, all the trainings in case you need it. Uh, it's